Today is a unique day, and it's far bigger than we think, because there are many different kinds of mothers, and all are being honored today. For the mother who's chosen to stay at home while her children are little, may your patience be great and your influence even greater. For the single mom who never planned on doing this alone, may you be consistently strengthened by your Heavenly Father, and may you hear His voice singing over you. For the mother who strives to balance work outside the home with love inside the home, may you be given energy, validation, and hope as you make the leap from one world to another every day. For moms who had poor mothers themselves, but who now refuse to let that pattern repeat itself. May the godly legacy you've started be carried on for generations to come. For mothers with grown adult children, may today be filled with laughter and joy, and may you experience deep satisfaction and fulfillment. For women who have no biological children of their own, but who mother younger women as mentors, May you understand your role as a calling from God and as a transformation of their hearts. Today is a unique day, so for all the mothers we mentioned and even those we didn't, be blessed, be honored, be filled with joy. You are making the world a better place because you're filling it with a love that only a mom can give. A little girl was asked what she wanted to be when she grew up, and she said, a mother. When asked if she wanted boys or girls, she replied, I don't want any children, I just want to be a mother. <laughs> the same little girl was shown pictures of her mother and father on their wedding day. She asked her father, Dad, is that the day you got mom to come to work for you? A third grader said it well when he had to write a story entitled, What is a Grandmother? He wrote, a grandmother is a lady who has no children of her own. She likes other people's little boys and girls. A grandfather is a male grandmother. <laughs> he goes for walks with boys and, and they talk about fishing and stuff like that. Grandmothers don't have to do anything except be there. They're old, so they shouldn't run or play hard. <laughs> it's enough that they drive us to the mall where the pretend horse is and they have lots of quarters ready. Or they take us for walks. They should slow down past things like pretty leaves and caterpillars. They should never say, hurry up. Usually grandmothers are fat, but not too fat to tie your shoes. They wear glasses and funny underwear. <laughs> they can take their teeth and gums off. <laughs> Grandmothers don't have to be smart. They only answer questions like, why isn't God married? And how come dogs chase cats? Grandmothers don't talk baby talk like visitors do because it's hard to understand. When they read to us, they don't skip or mind if it's the same story over and over again. Everybody should try and have a grandmother, especially if you don't have television, because they're the only grown-ups who have time. Well, today is Mother's Day. Who does more for us than our mother? And who's taken for granted more than our mom? It's only right that we should devote a day each year in honor of these women who devoted their lives to their families and other people's families, to their church, and most importantly, to their children. Mother's Day was originally founded in Europe, and it was called Mothering Day, and I like that. And it was a time when, when people came back to their home church, to the mother church. That's where that name comes from, their mother church. And uh, we've gotten into celebrating mothers, and the video said there's more to it than just the mothers of our children. 
And I'm always, I said to somebody a couple of weeks ago, I was always leery of Mother's Day because there's so many feelings around Mother's Day, both good and not so good. I know that this can be a difficult day for mothers who, for those who've lost a mother or had a miscarriage perhaps, who are single, who can't have children or choose not to have children, those who are estranged from their mother or their child. And for those reasons, some churches call this day Festival of Christian Family. And it's time to celebrate and give thanks to our family relationships, which include individual families, but also our family of faith. And this somehow fits together for me under the title of my sermon this morning, which is the art of Christian nurture, the art of Christian nurturing. Johnny said a teacher to one, one of her young pupils, do you think you could explain the class the difference between like and love? Well, said Johnny, I like my parents, but I love chocolate bars. Well, this Mother's Day, it's a day when we show our mother they're at least as important to it as chocolate bars. Um, I must tell you, though, that one mom had a most revealing experience on Mother's Day. Her two children ordered her to stay in bed. You just stay in bed this morning, Mom. We'll look after things. So she lay there looking forward to being brought her breakfast in bed. And pretty soon, the inviting smell of bacon drifted up the stairs from the kitchen. At last, the children called her downstairs. She found them sitting at the table, each with a large plate of bacon and eggs. As a Mother's Day surprise, they said, we cooked our own breakfast. Not quite what she had expected. (laughs) It was about three o'clock on a winter Saturday morning. I was laying quietly in my sleeping bag, listening intently to the whispers of kids attending our youth group sleepover at the church in Muscadavid Harbor, Nova Scotia. Even though it was my first church as a pastor, I knew that it would be unwise to fall asleep from past experience. After all, I was a kid once. I was a teenager, believe it or not. Another part of this I knew from previous sleepover when I had actually fallen asleep. When I awakened in the middle of the night, there were no kids left in the room. And from the storage area at the back of the hall, I heard someone whisper, strip poker. It got my attention right away. So there I was this second night, refusing to fall into that trap again laying quietly, listening to the giggles, and just waiting for the next move. It came soon enough. One by one, they crept down the hallway, opened the door, and disappeared into the cold winter night. I knew they wouldn't go far, because I heard them saying they were going to make some snowballs, and they were coming back to give them to me as a gift in one way or another. So I lay there waiting until they were all outside, and then I locked the door. (laughs) At first, there was the jiggling of the doorknob. Maybe it was stuck and they couldn't get it open. Then there was anxious whispers and a rattling noise as they tugged more forcefully at the door. All the while, their voices becoming more and more urgent. I could hear one kid say they were getting cold. Knock on the door, someone bugged. Someone said, no way, he'll kill us, they said. And just as the anxiety reached its peak, I slipped out a side door, made a couple of snowballs, and then screaming like a banshee, I jumped out of the night behind, from behind a snowdrift, and I pelted them with snowball after snowball. It only took the kids a moment to react, but once they did, they quickly outnumbered me and outflanked me, and I ended up in a snowdrift with a whole bunch of them laughing and jumping on top of me and shoving fistfuls of snow down the back of my neck. It was hilarious. And as I lay there, completely vanquished, but yet enjoying the playful antics of those teenagers, my eyes happened to drift down the darkened street to a big white parsonage where we lived, where Joyce and I lived, and there was a light on in the bedroom. For a brief instant, the sounds of the kids in the cold of the night just sort of melted into the background as I realized the light was on for an important reason. 
In my mind's eye, I could picture Joy sitting there in the rocker, gently cradling our newborn child, nursing and singing and rocking her back to sleep. And for a frozen moment in time, both literally and figuratively, my mind drew a connection between the tiny infant in the arms of her mother down the street and those wonderful teenage kids pig-piling on me in a snowdrift in front of the church. At that miraculous instant, I imagined my daughter not only as she was, but also who she might one day become. One of the most important teachings in the early Christian church was a thought yet like this. People are not only what they appear to be right now. People are also what they have the potential to become. It says this in our scripture today, in 1 John, as we I'd ask you to read it in unison with me. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it does not, did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. This morning I want to speak to you for a few moments about the thought behind this text, which I would call the art of Christian nurturing. It is one of the most powerful and practical practices by which you and I can touch the lives of others with the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can see one version of this kind of nurture in our celebration of Mother's Day. For you and I well know that most of us were not simply born and sent out to live in a world on our own. We were lovingly and carefully nurtured by persons who not only saw us as we were, but also dreamed about what we might become. And how thankfully for our, we are for our mothers and fathers and all others who have given us this gift of nurtured growth. In my life, beside my own mother, I had other mothers in my life. May LeBlanc, Gary LeBlanc, who teaches at Crandall, May LeBlanc was mother to me as well as my own mother. And she was also mother to Gordon Heisey as well as his own mother. Gordon had lost his mother at a young age and May stepped in and Gordon was known as son number four in that family. Now, I don't know how Heisey equates with LeBlanc, but somehow they worked that out. And then I was spent as much time at that place, and I was known as son number five. I just lived down the street, but I spent a lot of my time with May LeBlanc, who had a profound influence on my life. Then Loretta Lehman was my first grade teacher, and she was a Christian lady, and uh, she had a big influence. She was the only one that ever gave me the strap. <laughs> now, th that was nurturing in a way. But uh, it was hard for me to imagine that she would give me the strap. But I was a bit of a comedian and a cut-up back in those days as well. In my teenage years, it was Verna Berry. And then at Camp Wildwood, it was one person that you all know. It was Betty uh, Reed, who was Betty Williams, as you know her, that lives down Lower Cape. And Betty, Betty would do things for... Some of us kids at camp, like, uh, sneak food to us late at night if we'd come up by the kitchen door. And uh, the chief cook at that time was Howie Reed, and I don't think he liked that practice. I'm not even sure if he knew that she did that. But she, she nurtured us as, a, as teenage boys and girls at Camp Wildwood when we were there. But the art of Christian nurture is not the same. It's not just a focus on children, but on adults as well. And it's not just within families, but between families and beyond families. Its context is not just the circle with which within I live and move, but it's an all-inclusive circle of people as a whole. And the dream that drives Christian nurture is not a vision of some human ideal, but the very belief that we've been created to become like Christ. I think the first step 
in developing the art of Christian nurturing is this. That he begins right there in, as we presu- per- perceive God at work in the midst of the human. That as we meet people and relate to people, young and old, we perceive God at work in their lives. They may not even know Christ yet, but we're told we're made in the image of God. And we perceive God at work in the midst of the human. And that's the first step in nurturing people in a, in a Christian way. We see that image of God in every person if we look for it. One of the great stories of this spiritual perception is in the book of Exodus, in the story of Moses. You know who I'm talking about, Moses, that big-time Egyptian mucky muck. You know, the deliverer, Moses, the leader who brought the Hebrew people out of bondage, out of Egypt. Moses, the guy who played Charlton Heston in the movie The Ten Commandments. Or was it the other way around? Moses was nothing but for those who nurtured his soul. And among them were some plain old midwives. Do you remember the story? Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, became paranoid about the growing Hebrew population, fearful that the Jewish slaves might rise up against him. Pharaoh ordered the midwives to kill all the male Hebrew babies in the process of birth. As they helped the mothers give birth, they could tell the mothers that their baby had simply died. Some midwives, would, he, they were told to kill them. So what did the midwives do? Well, these heroic women cooked up a grand story. They told Pharaoh that the Hebrew women were sort of like the Arnold Schwarzenegger of pregnancy. They were so robust, these women, that they had, when they had babies, they just came popping out of them. And before the midwives could do anything, the mothers were nursing them. They couldn't very well take them from them then. So they couldn't get there in time. By the time they arrived, they were already being a mother to their children that were just born. And they couldn't execute Pharaoh's plan. And Pharaoh, not being the brightest bulb on the Christmas tree, believed them. Now the Bible says that the midwives acted so courageously, risking their own lives to save those babies because they feared God. In the messenger, in the, in the message, the, the book Peterson says, far in, in describing the fear of God, far too much, much respect for God to do something like this. They were in awe of God. Another way of describing what happened with the midwives is they perceived the wonder and majesty of God in the birth, in the lives of those innocent children. And seeing God present at work, they risked their lives by telling Pharaoh a falsehood. They used their creativity. They lived unselfishly so that God's dream could be fulfilled in the life of these tiny human persons. You see, the art of Christian nurturing is first of all perceiving God at work in the midst of the human. And I wonder what you see when you look at your children as I look at mine, your spouse, your neighbors, that street person the oppressed, that person addicted to drugs and alcohol. What do you see when you look at them? This week, I invite you to take up the art of Christian nurturing. Look at those around you and see them as a potential Moses or Miriam or Joshua. Be awed by the fact that God is in their lives, at work, transforming them into the likeness of Christ. The art of Christian nurturing begins with a practice of seeing God at work in the midst of the human. Secondly, it's the practice of stirring up God in the lives of others. Stirring up God in others' lives by gently helping others set sail towards God. You know, Barbara Mandrell talks about wanting to acquaint her baby Nathan when he was born with the presence of God from the earliest days of his life. So being a singer... Barbara sang three songs to Nathan every day that she hoped would form positive images in his mind. So she sang, Jesus loves me, this I know. And she sang, this is the day that the Lord has made. And she also sang, Jesus loves the little children. She sang those three songs over and over to him in his early years. Every day. And she says, the whole family breathlessly waited to hear which of these three tunes little Nathan would first begin to hum or sing? 
Finally, the day came. They heard him singing to himself in his room, as little children do. So they crept down the hall to his door, and they listened intently. But what they heard wasn't, Jesus loves me, this I know. It wasn't, this is the day. Nor was it, Jesus loves the little children. The tune little Nathan was humming was the tune of his mother's latest hit, All My Exes Live in Texas. <laughs> so nurturing is not an exact science sometimes, which ought to teach us there's a difference between short-term and long-term nurturing. So often we want people to come to faith now. We won't desire our children to turn away from bad things and turn toward good things now. We want people to be, we love to be healed of the things that make them broken. And we wish that they would be made well now. But Christian faith, dear friends, is a lifetime process. I guess you, most of you have figured that out by now. It will not be completed in any of us, according to 1 John, until Jesus comes. So our work in stirring up the divine within people's hearts that God sends our way needs to be gentle and releasing and trusting of God's mercy and grace. We see this in the life of Moses' mother. For when Pharaoh got over being put off by the midwives, he simply ordered the execution of all the male Hebrew children by having them tossed into the Nile River to drown. And Moses' mother, in a tremendous act of faith, puts her baby in a basket, and she, she patches it up with tar so it will float, and she pushes it out of the bulrushes and sets her child's sail toward heaven. What an image of how you and I are called to nurture the souls of others by gently letting them set sail for God and encourage them to set sail for God. I think of all the gifts that I've received in my life. Among the most important were my mother's persistent but careful nurturing and encouragement of me, encouragement of my singing, encouragement of my going to church where I could meet friends and hear the gospel, and my father's daily demonstration of that a man should work very hard, and then my church family's gentle exposure of my life to Christian service and high ideals. And over the course of my life, when I was 11 years old, on April 28, 1951, I accepted Jesus as my Savior and began to grow as he continued to nurture me through my life. And whenever I took my own direction, I often fell into potholes and things like that, that in my life that weren't very good. But as long as I gave Christ preeminence, he led me. And over the course of my lifetime, these gifts and the Holy Spirit led me to Jesus and service to bring him to others when I've had the opportunity. Oh, the art of Christian nurturing is first of all perceiving God at work in people's lives that don't know him. Secondly, it's the art of gently helping others set sail toward God. And there are gifts of the Spirit that you and I have that can fill the sails of people so they can journey towards the kingdom. We need to learn to give these gifts away and not just keep them to ourselves. When God gives spiritual gifts, he gives them to exercise. And if we don't use them, we lose them. And thirdly, the art of Christian nurture is the art of revealing Christ to others by our lives, by speaking directly into their lives and minds, by our conversation, as the, old, as the scriptures define the word conversation as our daily life, our way of living, going about our daily world, that we reveal Christ to others. The story of Moses takes a dramatic turn when the daughter of Pharaoh himself finds the baby in the basket in the bulrushes. And Moses' older sister Miriam sees that Pharaoh's daughter is taken by the baby and loves it at first sight. So Miriam pipes up and says, look, if you're going to keep the baby why don't I get you one of the Hebrew women to nurse him for you? Well, Pharaoh's daughter agrees, and Miriam goes to get her mother, Moses' mother. And in that strange and miraculous way that God is famous for, it works out that Moses is raised by his own mother in the house of Pharaoh. And while Moses grows, his mother teaches him about his heritage as a Hebrew. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> oh. 
Carol brought me up some water this morning, and Nick had a bottle of water for me. I think they know that windmills run by water. <laughs> and while Moses grows, as his mother taught him, he taught, she also taught him about the covenant with God, the God of Abraham, God of Isaac and Jacob. She teaches Moses about her belief in God as a God of love, as a God who cares about the enslaved, <coughs> as a God whose mercy is over all his works, as a God who sets people free. And years later, when Moses faces a crossroads moment in his life, he yields himself to this God his mother revealed to him. And Moses becomes a deliverer of Israel. Sometimes we forget in the rush of our lives as Christians that we are the body of Christ, the visible presence of Jesus in the world. We are his hands, his feet, his eyes, his lips. In fact, the very name that we bear, Christian, means like Christ. So the art of Christian nurture is only truly fulfilled when those people God sends to us can look at us and see Christ. And, and when we can help others clear away the dust of life's confusion to see who and what Christ is like. You see, Christ is not the crooked televangelist who manipulates the emotions of people to send him money. Christ is not the priest who molests little children. Christ is not the person you meet who tries to scare you into tell salvation and tells you how bad you are. Christ is not the parent who denies his child medical care while waiting for a miracle. Christ is not the church that hits people over the head with a Bible, nor is the church that treats the Bible as a comic book. Christ is not the group that blows up abortion clinics, nor is he the group that promotes abortion. Christ is not the person who sits in church and can't bring himself to step beyond his clique, the people that he knows, and welcome a stranger. Christ is not a territorial battle fought out in a church committee meeting. Christ is not the Christian who testifies to salvation, but yet does nothing for the poor, the hungry, and the hurting people. Oh, all around us are examples of who and what Christ is not. A question for us today so how will the people of God, how will the people God sends your way discover who Christ is? Why, through you, you can point the way to the Christ you've met. In Christ you know the Christ you believe in. This is all the art of Christian nurture, to see God at work among the people you meet, to give people gentle gifts that help them set sail towards God, to help others catch sight of Jesus and his mercy in his love. I'd like to tell you a story that I read recently to close my sermon this morning. And it's about mothers that don't sometimes get recognized as mothers in our lives. And there's some of you here today. Some of you are retired. Some of you are still doing it. You're teachers. There's a lot of teachers in our congregation. And God uses you as mothers in your classroom many times, on many occasions. This is a story about Mrs. Thompson, who was a teacher. She stood in front of her fifth grade class on the very first day of school, and she told the children a lie. Like most teachers, she looked at her students and said that she loved them all the same. That was a lie, she told. However, that was impossible, because there in the front row, slumped in his seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard, Mrs. Thompson had watched Teddy a year before and noticed that he did not play well with other children. That his clothes were messy and he, he had a, a distinct fragrance about him when he'd come to school. He constantly needed a bath. In addition, Teddy could be unpleasant. It got to the point where Mrs. Thompson would actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen making big X's and putting a big F at the top of the page. And at the school where Mrs. Thompson taught, they had a good practice. Every teacher early in the school year was to, with each of their students, was to read 
their child's, the child's past records in school. And she put Teddy's off to last because she, she imagined what it was going to be like. How, however, when she re reviewed his file, she was in for a surprise. Teddy's first grade teacher wrote, Teddy's a bright child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly and has good manners. He's a joy to be around. His second grade teacher wrote, Teddy's an excellent student, well liked by his classmates, but he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home must be a struggle. His third grade teacher wrote, his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much interest and his home life will soon affect him if some steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn and doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and he sometimes sleeps in class. By now, Mrs. Thompson realized the problem and she was ashamed of herself. She even felt worse when her students brought her Christmas presents wrapped in beautiful ribbons and bright paper. They all were wrapped that way except for Teddy's. His present was clumsily wrapped in a heavy brown paper that he got from a grocery store bag. Mrs. Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she found a rhinestone bracelet with some of the stones missing and a bottle that was a quarter full of perfume. But she stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was putting it on and dabbed some of the perfume on her wrist and behind her ear. Teddy Stoddard stayed after school that day, just long enough to say this, Mrs. Thompson, today you smell just like my mom. Just like she used to. And after the children left, she cried for about an hour. On that very day, she quit teaching, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Instead, she began to teach children. Instead of the subject, she began to teach children. Mrs. Thompson paid particular attention to Teddy as she worked with him. His mind seemed to come alive. The more she encouraged him, the faster he responded. By the end of the year, Teddy had become one of the smartest children in the class, and despite her lie, that she would love all the children the same. Teddy became one of her teacher's pets. A year later, she found a note under her door from Teddy telling her that she was the best teacher he ever had in his, in her, in his whole life. Six years went by before she got another note from Teddy. He wrote that he had finished high school, third in his class, and that she was still the best teacher he ever had. Four years after that, she got another letter saying, while things were tough at times, he stayed in school and stuck with it and would soon graduate from university with the highest of honors. He assured Mrs. Thompson that she was still the best and favorite teacher he ever had. Then four more years passed, and another letter came. This time he explained that after he got his bachelor's degree, he decided to go a little further. The letter explained that she was still the best, most favorite teacher he ever had, but by now his name was a little longer. The letter was signed, Theodore Stoddard, M.D. The story doesn't end there. You see, there was yet another letter that spring. Teddy said he had met this girl and was going to be married. He explained that his father had died a couple years ago, and he was wondering if Mrs. Thompson might agree to sit at the wedding in the place that was usually reserved for the mother of the groom. Of course she did. She wore that bracelet, that rhinestone bracelet, to the wedding. And she was wearing that perfume that Teddy remembered his mother wearing on their last Christmas together. They hugged each other, and Dr. Stoddard whispered in Mrs. Thompson's ear, Thank you, Mrs. Thompson, for believing in me. Thank you so much for making me feel important and showing me that I could make a difference. Mrs. Thompson, with tears in her eyes, whispered back, Teddy, 
you have it all wrong. You were the one who taught me that I could make a difference. I didn't know how to teach until I met you. Excuse me. I find as you get older that <laughs> you're, um, some of you older folks like me have probably experienced this. As you get older, your bladder moves up behind your eyes. <laughs> and uh, if you're a hard man, don't cry. Wait till you get a little older. It happens, and it's a good thing. that We don't need Visine or anything like that. Or, Fix your eyes, or I in my case. This is the art of Christian nurturing that I've talked about this morning. Why, through you, you can point others to the Christ that you've met. To see God at work in the people that you meet, to give people that, those gentle gifts that help them set sail toward God to help others catch sight of Jesus and his mercy and his love. Beloved as Christians, we are God's children now, and it does not appear what we shall be like, but we know that when his Christ is revealed, we shall be like him. May these words become your prayer this week as God shows us how to practice the art of Christian nurturing, not only to children, but to people of all ages. Let us pray together. Lord God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. And I pray, Lord, that it's been conveyed to all of us this morning by your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, that you help us to examine our lives and see where we stand before you. And if we don't know you, Lord, may we come to faith in you before it's too late and before we... We give up the opportunity of being nurturers to other people. We thank you today for the mothers that you've given us. We give you thanks for all the mothers, whether they were teachers or our own birth mother or whoever, Lord, in our lives that has helped us set sail toward God and reveal Christ to us. We pray in Jesus' name.